first, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, Developer Day is uh, just a great opportunity for us to get to interact with you face to face. Um, my name is Lane Lee Broughton. I work on the Google Data team. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. This is my first time in London, so it's, it's great to see your city. Uh, I, I work in the Mountain View office, so I uh, just came in for this. Um, I'm going to talk about the Google Data APIs today. Uh, it's, um, let's just dive right in here. Um, so Google offers a lot of APIs. Uh, you've already been to some sessions, uh, learned about some other ones. Uh, the Google Data APIs uh, is really a suite. You get a, a whole bunch of APIs for the price of one when you come to this talk. So uh, you're probably familiar with the Ajax APIs. Uh, these are some of our most popular maps um, and search. Uh, these let you put some of Google's user interface onto your website. Um, you get a lot of the um, features of Google Maps and the other applications, um, and you can uh, add your own content. Um, the AdWords APIs, gadgets, these are pretty popular also. Um, basically, for all of our services, we try to make uh, pro programmatic access for you developers to create applications. Uh, we're going to talk about the Google Data APIs, and here I say they're uh, full fidelity data APIs. So what I mean by that is for the various data services, uh, calendar, blogger, spreadsheets, um, we aim to give you all the functionality that you have in the user interface through uh, this API. And we, we try to enable as many services as we can. So we've had a lot of great feedback about Google Data since we launched it about a year ago. Um, this quote is kind of a high-level view of you know, what it means if we have this single protocol to access all different kinds of structured data on the internet. Um, you know, Google's a great place to incubate a pro protocol like this because we have so many users, because we have so much content, and we have a, ride, a wide range of services from calendar to blogger to base uh, to try and create a generic API and protocol that can access different types of structured data. Uh, the other great benefit of Google Data APIs is it gives you access to these Google services that already have huge user bases. There's lots of content in there for you to uh, play around with, mash up in different ways. Um, so we get you know, really excited feedback like this from developers uh, because it, you, know, you can create your own little application. All of a sudden, you might have millions of users you know, right off the bat. And when you create something useful and creative, uh, you can get a lot of exposure. Uh, by accessing the content that data or that Google provides. So the goals of G Data are really in alignment with the goals of Google itself. Um, our motto is to you know make the world's information uh, universally accessible. Um, so we have Google services such as you know you see here, and users have already uh, submitted a lot of content to that. And we've structured them into these different services. And we have our own data structures. Uh, but we want to make that data accessible to you as developers so that you can make it accessible to your end users. Um, so in order to do that, we've taken these services. We've added this API as an extension to the service itself. Uh, but that's, that's not really helping us quite yet. Um, unless your favorite you know, programming language is XML, you're going to probably want to use one of these uh, client libraries that we support. Uh, right now, we support these five. Uh, they're pretty popular languages. Maybe your favorite's not there, but we've had some people uh, develop their own client libraries. And this really helps developers get started quickly with uh, the Google Data APIs. Um, you can download these client libraries. There's sample code in there. And you're up and running right away. Uh, we'll show an example later. So what, what is Google Data? What is the protocol? What, is it, what does it mean, really? So it's a REST-based protocol, uh, which uh, as opposed to SOAP. Uh, it's based on the Atom publishing protocol, and actually it just has a few extensions uh, for, that we see here. Uh, it's simple. It's just XML. Uh, it's, there's lots of tools for parsing XML um, in all your favorite languages. Uh, and it's standardized. Uh, it works with APP and the Atom syndication format. Um, this didn't quite provide everything we need, uh, so we have some extensions for our data services. The first is just the data model itself. So with Google Calendar, you have more information than what you could reasonably handle with just APP. Uh, things like event start times and participants. 
Uh, with the Google base, you have all sorts of extensions to the data that you can store there. Uh, another issue is uh, concurrency, since there's so many users and hopefully lots of third-party developed uh, applications. Uh, we want to make sure that there's not conflict if my application and your application both access the same calendar event. Uh, we need to deal with that concurrency problem. Uh, third is queries. I mean, we're Google. We love to get the data, index it, and search it. Uh, that's what we do best. And so we uh, have a number of ways that you can access your data once it's been indexed. And finally, authentication. A lot of the content on Google for these services is, is private information. Calendars, um, spreadsheets and documents. They're, it's private information that we need to make sure that the user knows your third party application is going to access it because they could change it, delete it, whatever. So we have a couple schemes for authentication. Uh, when you put all that together, you get you know, what we refer to as the G-Data feed. Uh, and we'll, we'll show an example of that here. Um, so this is a G-Data representation of a calendar event. And I won't bore you by going through this line by line. Um, there's a lot of information here. But what I want you to take away here is, uh, in, highlighted in blue here, is the standard APP elements. We have an ID, uh, an author of the entry, a uh, title for the event, and some content, just a description. But like I said earlier, that's not quite enough for things like a calendar event. Uh, we need to also uh, have, keep track of some more information. So this is the same entry. And here we have highlighted uh, the, the data model that we've added in. So there's some standard, a standard G-Data schema that has uh, various elements. Uh, in this case, you know, start time and end time. You can add a reminder for your event. Um, and then also some things for the UI, like if the event is visible or what color it is. Uh, that's all supported for that full fidelity idea. Uh, another thing we've done here is uh, we have the concept of kinds. So when we see you know, these groups of elements grouped together in certain ways, uh, we try to make that generic and uh, we call it a kind. So this is an event kind. Uh, it's, the schema is right up here at the top with this category. Um, we've also defined some other kinds, and we plan to keep <laughs> defining them as we find more types of information. Uh, this lets you, as a programmer, you know, know what, what sort of things to expect uh, when you see an event or a, a message or a contact. OK, so this, is, um, this slide kind of shows uh, how we handle optimistic con concurrency. Uh, I just want to first talk about the problem a little bit. So let's say my application uh, downloads somebody's calendar entry. And I want to change you know, the title of the event. Maybe it's for this presentation. I change the topic. Uh, then someone else's uh, application also downloads that same entry. And they change you know, the time. They're, we're going to shuffle the schedule around. So now I, I might go and put my updates back to the server. And now that new title is in there. And the other application then puts their updates in there. Now they have a new time, but they still have the old title. So that's going to either clobber my data. We need to somehow avoid that. So the way we do that is a really simple model with versioning. Uh, we call it optimistic concurrency. And this kind of is an example. So this is our first look at kind of the REST-based uh, attributes of the GData protocol, uh, you send a git to get the entry, and you receive a 200, and you receive the entry. Um, and you'll get this uh, edit link. And it's going to have an ID for the entry that you got, but also a version. In this case, it's a new event. It's just version 1. So now you know, I go ahead and I update my title, and I put it back. Uh, and I'll receive uh, a 200 OK with the updated event back. And now the server will give it a new version. Then let's say the other application they have that stale. They still have version 1. And they've changed the time. When they try to put it back, uh, they're going to get a 409 conflict. Or in this case, if they try to cancel my presentation altogether, uh, they'll get a 409 conflict. So you know, in that case, they would need to get the event again. And then they can make their changes when they have the latest version. So this is just a simple way that we avoid those kinds of issues. OK, so as I said, we love to query data. Uh, we have a number of ways that we can do it. You know, the first most basic is just a full text search. This is kind of like the query you might enter into the Google search box on Google.com. You can just enter any sort of uh, text, 
and any information that's been indexed will be searched. So things, the content, the title, the author, any of the extension elements that are indexed are going to be searchable by this uh, parameter. And all of these URLs, you just send a git to this URL, and you'll receive the feedback with the entries. And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Another example of ways to query information is by using a category. So this example uses Google Base, which uh, might have vehicles, it has uh, jobs, housing. And using, specifying a category will right away trim down the information to just the types of data that you want to get. And then you can always add more parameters in addition to specifying a category. Uh, there's, across all the data services, there's some standard query parameters, like updated time. Uh, publish time. Uh, because it's based on Atom protocol, we know that there's going to be certain attributes that are, exist in all of the data services. So for those, you're guaranteed that you're going to have those. But then, it, you know, for some data services, there's just other things we want to search on. Uh, it just makes sense for, like, spreadsheets, for example, to be able to search on, you know, rows in your spreadsheet. Uh, for calendar, you might search on when the, when the event starts or ends. So uh, this shows kind of the extensibility of the protocol, we can not only handle any sort of data, but we can also query by it, too. Um, and the, the last uh, bullet I have here is for the output format. So by default, you'll get back a GData feed like we saw. But you could also uh, specify JSON if you're writing a JavaScript application. You can uh, send your query and get your results back in JSON format, <coughs> so you can treat it like a Java object, a JavaScript object. Um, you can also specify RSS feed in the format. Uh, and as, as we support new formats, this will be the standard way to specify what you want to get back. OK, so we talked about the different attributes and extensions of GData. Um, well, you know, what do we do with it? How do we use it? Uh, so this, this slide kind of shows the rest nature, the restful nature of GData. Uh, to achieve all your CRUD operations, right? Create, retrieve, update, delete. That's what we want to do with this data uh, to make it, to access it programmatically. So if we're going to create something, we just send an HTTP post message uh, to, in this case, a blog. A blog has a URL. Uh, it could be a calendar. It could be a, a specific spreadsheet. Um, so then if you want to retrieve data, like I said, you just send a git to the a URL and you specify any of those query parameters that we talked about. Uh, and then uh, one of the attributes of the feeds are the links, the relative links, and one of them is the edit link. So if you ever want to modify the data, uh, you just send your updated version of the entry to the edit link in, with the HTTP put, and you'll receive back an, uh, a response from the server. And then finally, you can also send a delete to that edit link and it will remove it from the server. So we, let's take a little closer look at each of these, uh, the requests and responses. So we'll keep with the blogger example. Uh, in this case, you know, we'll say the URL is just my feed. So the first thing you want to do, create a blog entry. Uh, you just send a post HTTP message with uh, the entry that you want to create in the, in the body of the message. In this case, it's just standard APP. There's no extra stuff here. Uh, for Blogger, that works great. Uh, we just have the author, title, and content. Uh, what you receive back from the server, then, you get a 201 created message that your object has been created. Uh, but you'll, and you'll receive you know, the information you sent, but the server's going to add some stuff for you. Uh, there's an ID to keep track of the element. Here's the edit link that I was just talking about. And we see the uh, version there. Uh, and then also, when the server actually processed your request to publish or update the event, it'll send that information back to you. OK, so now let's say we have some entries there and we want to query them. Uh, we just send a git to the URL of the feed, in this case a blog, uh, with a query parameter. Uh, if you notice, the entry we were working with, the author's name was Bennett, so we'll search for uh, just a full text search with the keyword Bennett. And we'll get back a whole feed. Um, so the root element here is a feed. And there's information about the blog itself, the title, the author, when the blog itself was updated. And then you'd get back a collection of these entries. Um, in this case, there's only one. Uh, we only added one thing. 
but you might get back multiple entries and you can parse through this uh, to get all the information you need, the edit link, uh, when it was updated, published. So you'll need that edit link if you want to change anything. So in the next one, let's say we want to change uh, the content. Obviously, it's just something new and updated. Uh, we'll grab the edit link and we'll just send an HTTP put with our entry in the message body. And then the server will, as long as the version is correct and up to date, the server will update its information on, online. OK, so what you'll get back from that put is, a, again, a 200 OK with the entry in the message body. But in this case, the server will have updated the version here. And we'll also give you a new updated time. And of course, uh, the new content that we chose to update. And then again, using the edit link, uh, we can delete the entry. It almost seems too easy here. Uh, there's not a lot to show. <laughs> so uh, you'll just get a 200 OK back indicating that the information is taken away from the server. So um, problem is, right, it's too easy. And I don't want to go around deleting everyone's information. So we have to look at authentication. So I mean, we talked about how it's really powerful. There's lots of users. There's tons of data. Uh, but we have to somehow police who's accessing what. We want the users to be able to control if your application can touch their data or not. Uh, some of the information is public. You can have public calendars, blogs. Um, so a lot of the read information you know, you don't need to be authenticated for. But we don't want anybody to be able to post to your blog or delete your entries if they don't like them. So we have two schemes for authentication. And basically, the idea here is to get the user's credentials into Google. And Google will give you an authentication token back. You can then use that token in any of your subsequent HTTP requests that we looked at. Just put it in as an HTTP header. And Google will look at that header and allow access or deny it. So the two types, uh, one is for installed applications, one's for web applications. For an installed application, something that you know, someone might download and run a setup on, and uh, it's just a, a thick client, basically, the user's going to have to just enter their credentials into your application. And then your application can go to the client login service uh, and with those credentials. And if they're valid, it'll return an authentication token to you that you can use. Uh, for web apps, uh, we have a little, little better control over who gets to see the user's information. Right? So the user never actually has to give your web application their Google credentials. Uh, what we do is we have you forward your users to Google's site. Uh, and Google, the users can then enter their credentials into Google's website. And Google will say, you know, this third party application is trying to access your calendar. Do you want to grant or deny this access? And when the user, if the user chooses to grant you access, then we'll redirect them back to your web application. But in this model, the only person who ever sees the user's credentials is Google, which is um, preferable for the user and their privacy. OK, so we talked about all the extensions now. I think we saw a little example. Um, I just want to show this list of you know, what services are enabled again. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fairly substantial list already, and it keeps getting bigger. Uh, as I said, the goal is to make as much of the content that we have you know, programmatically available using the one standard uh, API. So one thing that's great about using GData and our client libraries is if you wanted to create a mashup between any of these, you're all set. It, you use the same protocol, the same client library to access all of these different uh, Google data services. So let me just show an example of uh, a mashup between Google Spreadsheets and Google Calendar. Uh, this example is available with our client library downloads. Uh, it's written in Python using the Python library. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, the new APIs page. It just recently had a facelift, so it looks a little different. But it gives you an idea of you know, that first slide I had that showed how many APIs we have. You know, we're not kidding. We've got a lot of them. And there's some, there's some cool ones in here. Um, OK, so to get back on track. So here's a spreadsheet. It's just got data, right? This is not that interesting. Uh, it just has some names of people and their birthdays. And then it has a link to a, a URL. Um, if we want to make this more usable or interesting for our users, we could import it to Calendar. And that's just what this example does. So let me pull it up here. 
Uh, it's just a, a simple Python script. I think I have it up here. Right. Um, again, the GData Python client is the name of our client library. So the first thing it's going to do is ask me to authenticate. This is an example of uh, an installed app, even though it's just a, a script running here. Um, but so I'll, I'll give it my credentials, and it'll log in on my behalf. Okay, so I had a little uh, slow connection. I think um, the, first, the first thing that it's going to do is look at my spreadsheets account and see how many documents I have, and it'll give me a list back. So in this case, I have you know, a few documents under this user, and you know, this just illustrates the idea that you can get back a list of documents that a user has um, programmatically. Um, we'll use the, the birthdays, clearly, is the one we want to use here. Uh, once I've specified a spreadsheet, you know, spreadsheets can have multiple pages on them. So the spreadsheet's data API allows you to also get that as a feed. For a particular spreadsheet, you could get a list of sheets. In this case, I only have one, so we'll pick it. Okay, so now it's going, it's grabbing the information from the spreadsheet, and it's going to update my calendar and add an event to my calendar for each one of those birthdays. Slowly. It's also going to, if it doesn't time out, it will also uh, update this spreadsheet here, uh, which we should see in real time if it kicks back here. All right. So it'll let us know as it, as it makes. OK, great. <laughs> we got one. So it added out Einstein's birthday. I'm not sure what the connection problem is in this room or something. I had the same problem earlier. Um, so now we can see we're, we're updating events. I think there's one more, maybe. So this whole time on the back end, it's, it's making requests. It's posting new events to my calendar uh, and performing gits on this spreadsheet that we see here. Uh, let's go see if my calendar is updated yet. OK, so here we go. Let's see if it updated my document. It didn't yet. OK, so here's the event. I, I wanted to show this example in particular because it uses a new feature of the calendar uh, API. Um, this little icon here is, um, signifies a web content event. And we call it web content because when you uh, select this, you, this actually shows a pop-up div with any HTML that you specify. Basically, when I created this event, I uh, added a link to an HTML page that contains an image, you know, this image link from my spreadsheet. So, you know, we talked about how the Ajax APIs let you put Google's UI on your site. This is uh, the counterpart to that. You can now put, you know, your mark on Google Calendar. Uh, it's a really cool feature, and um, I'm just starting to see some examples of it out in the wild. So, I'm anxious to see how you guys are all using this. So, so let's go back. Let's see if this ever updated here. All right, the connection there is bad. Okay, so let me get back to my slides here. Uh, so we saw this list. Um, one thing I want to say, we have some developer groups. I'll talk about it more, but you know, the list keeps growing. How does it grow? Uh, what do we? How do we choose what APIs we're going to provide or not, um, and what functionality? So. The one driver is the idea of a, fully, a full fidelity API. So as new features come into the UIs, we're driven to add that, make that accessible through the APIs. The other driver is you. Right? We have developer groups. We, like, we love to hear from you. Uh, we have pages where you can post feature requests. You can just discuss new ideas or concepts in the group. And that's another big driver for which direction we're moving in. We want to make this data available, but we also want to make the APIs you know, conducive for you guys to develop cool apps. We need to know what you want to build before we can you know, make it available. Uh, by listening to you, we can create, you know, spend our time on what's most valuable for you and ultimately the end users. So I talked a little bit about the uh, client libraries. 
they're all open source. So as we roll out new features in the UI and you see something that's not supported in the library, you know, we'd love to have you implement new solutions and share it with the community. Um, you know, if your favorite library isn't one of these supported ones, we've had developers just completely write their own. Uh, these three have just been completely contributed from developers. Uh, that's always great to see that and, you know, it's definitely encouraged and we love to, you know, the open source and the, we're building a great community around these APIs. So I mentioned the groups. The way we have the groups set up is for each data service, there's an API group. It's just Google Groups, and so if you're, you know, developing a mashup between calendar and spreadsheets like this, you probably want to subscribe to both of them, both of those groups. Um, so we, uh, we have support from Googlers going through there, reading threads and trying to respond and help with questions. Um, also, just there's a lot of great developers that already have experience with these APIs, and they've been a great help um, getting people up to speed on how to use them. Another great resource is a Google Data blog that we have. So not only will events like Developer Day be announced on the blog, but you'll also see updates if we release a new client library or new features in the services or APIs. Uh, that's all announced there, and it'll keep you up to speed. Uh, you might see some new feature that you know drives you to think of some new cool mashup. Uh, then on code.google.com, we have a couple resources. Uh, the knowledge base is basically a way for you. There's a wide range of information on there. There's some things like getting started, where's the documentation, how do I do this, is, is there any examples, um, but also some troubleshooting things that we uh, get right from the group. So when people have errors or have certain uh, tips about how to debug or do something, we'll put that into the knowledge base uh, and that's indexed so people can search on it. Uh, and we're always adding content to that. I mean, that's, uh, you know, in my experience as a developer, those are always great to see, you know, someone else had this problem, it's answered, you know, it's not just a thread that never uh, is resolved. Uh, and then the last one here, developer guides. Uh, we've recently revamped them. They used to be kind of one-dimensional. They just had, you know, a few examples of the schema, and maybe some Java samples or something. So now, for each of the services, we're creating uh, this full set of functionality, um, all your create, read, update, delete examples for each of our client libraries. So if you're not developing in Java, you still have examples to look at. So PHP, Python.net, the examples all exist out there, and it should just get you up and running really quickly. The same sample code that's on these developer guides online, it's also available when you download the client library. So again, just right out of the box, you can at least see how it works. Uh, you can look in there for the simple examples. And then as you do more complicated things, I would suggest joining the groups, asking questions, um, and just uh, being part of the discussion as these APIs grow. So uh, one thing that's great about having these groups, we, we get to directly interact with the developers, see what they're doing. Uh, we have uh, forums in the groups places that you can put your application on there and say, hey, you know, look at this cool app that I made. Um, we have lots of APIs, so these are just a, a couple examples. Uh, the ambient clock is kind of cool. Uh, Fixer Online Photo Editor is linked up with Picasa, and you can read and post your photos after you've edited them. Uh, a Timesheets and Google uh, Spreadsheets mashup. Obviously, there's some synergies. The timesheet data is always in a spreadsheet, but there's, it's associated with the time. Um, so this is just a few uh, examples. Um, you can post your own in our, in our groups and also on, on code.google.com. We're always trying to feature new projects and just you know, inspire people, see what kind of ideas are out there, what's being implemented, and what's, what's all the new applications out there. Um, so we already saw this birthday reminders example uh, built on the Python client library, just a a real quick uh, script there, a uh, mashup of spreadsheets and calendars. I have another example. Uh, it's written in JavaScript. Uh, basically, takes a spreadsheet full of Silicon Valley companies, uh, their locations, and some stock info, and just dis uh, displays them on a map. So it's just kind of a cool way to, to display some you know, data. So let's look at the spreadsheet that it uses. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so, you know, this, again, this is just data. It's just, it's structured data, but it's not, you know, not that interesting. It's certainly not really interactive. Um, 
yeah, this part, you know, it's just numbers, but what does it really mean? How can you make it more useful for your users? And so here's a mashup that uh, one of my colleagues put together. You know, it's a, it's a completely different view of that information. Uh, it uses the Spreadsheets API to access the information in that spreadsheet. And it just displays, you know, where these companies are located right in Silicon Valley and, you know, if their stock is up or down today. Uh, it uses some cool, you know, map features like displaying custom icons and, um, you know, just some basic information. Note the disclaimer here, though. It's, you know, it's just informational purposes. Don't go making trading decisions based on the information you get here. <laughs> Um, and then over here, it just uses a, a graphical tool to display, you know, price to earnings ratio. You know, rather than just having the number in a column, you know, you can read it out of Google Spreadsheets and display it in a more intuitive way here. Right. Ooh. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that was my presentation about Google Data. Again, I'm just glad to see everyone here. And I look forward to seeing what you guys can do with the APIs. Uh, at this point, I want to, do we have any questions that I can take? Uh, sure, actually we have some mics here, so sorry. Thanks. What's the licensing like for the GData protocol? Is it similar to with uh, uh, site, uh, site uh, maps? Site maps. Uh, the licensing is, we're still working out what exactly it's going to be. Uh, clearly, we're going to go with the same strategy that Chris talked about in the keynote and his open source. Uh, we want to make it as open and usable as possible. Uh, the quote, the first quote on here talked about all structured data on the web, not just Google structured data. So the idea is to, you know, everybody can use this one format and it's just going to make it easier for us to develop cool mashups. And by us, I mean us as developers, the people in this room, right? Um, so what's good for developers is good for Google, it's good for the internet. So, good question. We'll get it resolved soon, but it, you know, you can probably assume it's going to be as open as everything else. We're trying to make it available. Anything else? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I was just interested in why you've used um, like, uh, REST to implement that that API rather than something like SOAP. Is it is it readability, or is is there any other reason? Um, I think that it's just the intuitiveness, the way. The, the structured data and the services that we're accessing here really lends itself to just basic you know, CRUD operations. Uh, and there's that just interconnectedness with HTTP requests, you know, the puts, the gets. Um, there are some SOAP APIs at Google, but the, the Google data APIs themselves are all REST-based, just for intuitive, uh, intuitiveness, I think. Okay. Hi there. Um, uh, when talking about authentication, mm -hmm. um, your uh, saying that you know you log in with your Google um, address and password and so on and so forth for all these these different things. Why doesn't Google use something like OpenID or something if it wants such interoperability across you know both its own things and other people's applications? Right, uh, that's a great question. We we get that feature request a lot. Um, it would certainly enable some more uh, applications on the developer side and interoperability among sites. Uh, I'm not sure where it is in development, if it's on the roadmap or not, but you know, clearly we look to get this kind of feedback from you all. So you know, we've heard it a lot and it's definitely on our radar. So thanks for the question. Did you have one? Uh, yeah, you um, talked a lot about using things like the uh, Google spreadsheets and so forth and as a data source, and obviously there's the Maps data source and so forth. Right. And you can obviously get your data from alternative locations. Mm -hmm. How much support is in there for individuals to produce their own data storage within the Google system for either using the, for their own systems or for others to use? OK. Uh, let me see if I understand the question first. Maybe the, there's two questions there, maybe. Um, so there's often a um, question about what's the licensing on the protocol itself. Uh, can I implement a server that does GData? Is that your question, or is it more no. the data storage itself? Mm -hmm. If you don't uh, want to get Google actually data? being able to put your own data, basically using Google for your own database means, for database. example. Sure. Okay. Um, so Google Base uh, does almost exactly that. You can put a lot of information into Google Base. There are some limits, um, but we've had people 
store all sorts of information in there. Um, in the groups, I see all sorts of great ideas, um, people storing information in blogs, you know, and just different ways to use Google as a back end. You know, give us your data, we'll handle it, you know. Um, so that any sort of creative ways that you can come up with, we, we definitely want to let you do it. Any more? Okay, well, on, that, on that note, um, as you're providing APIs for, um, you know, for, for spreadsheets and databases and all these sorts of things, would it be possible, um, do you think, to have some sort of um, data abstraction from all of these so that the mashups, which you know, is, it seems to be the, uh, the most important point today, can almost be automated? Like the example that you gave of the, the, the stock market thing, if you simply provided a list of company names, mm -hmm. um, if you can abstract that out as, you know, Apple is a company, um, mm -hmm. then in your, um, your stock market ticker, you can get the financial information, and from your um, address book, you can get the ge geographical information. And you wouldn't even have to code any of this thing, but it would just take, uh, you, 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 you just say, I want these company names, do all the lookups, and get me financial information and geographical information and plot them together. I think that there's support for that in the protocol. Um, for example, when I was talking about different G-data kinds, um, that's sort of along the same lines. So you might have a company kind, and you know there's going to be geographic data in there. You know there's going to be financial data. Um, so programmatically, you could assume and build your own extensions to the client libraries to make classes like a company or something like that. Um, do, you, do you think there's the ability to, have to um, basically have a, an, an API API where you can, you can specify the forms of, of data that the API can export? So you can have a, a company or a graphic which can be mm -hmm. then associated with any item that the API itself is exporting? Um, I, I'm not sure that I understand the question, but um, it's extensible here, and uh, you could even create your own kinds. Uh, the client libraries will support uh, that, those types of interactions. If you wanted to automate, uh, I think at this point, it's going to be that's your third party application. That's what you use this data to build. Um, as it grows, yeah, there might be some logical ways to genericize things um, that might move in that direction. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any plans for a contacts and a Gmail API? Uh, that's another one that's often requested in the groups. Um, there's some ooh, there's some issues um, that we're looking at. It's definitely on our radar. We want to provide that. It's because it's requested. There's obvious value there. I, I'm not sure when it would be available, or you know, if, if we can provide it or not, or what form it'll take. But um, again, the goal is to make all the data that we have accessible. So. We want to do what we can. Thanks. Hi. I'm just wondering what the implications are of um, RSS feeds going through Google. One I can imagine is that you're able to determine which RSS feeds might be useful or, or are more timely. Um, are you able to explain any implications in, that, you, that are happening internally because you're having RSS feeds go through you? Hmm. That's that's an interesting idea. I, that's not really my area of expertise, um, but um, I can see how there could be information gleaned from that. Um, I can't really speak to it, though. Sorry. It's, a, it's an interesting idea, though, definitely. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming again. Uh, I'll enjoy the rest of my stay in London. I have quite a bit to see, I think. <laughs> thank you.